Welcome back to this special edition of InfoWars Nightly News. At the end of this next interview, we've got something really special coming up, so be sure and stay with us. But right now, we've got something incredibly important. They call Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers uh, you know, the most famous and most important whistleblower in modern U.S. history. Well, he just leaked some CIA RAND Corporation documents that the war was being lost in Vietnam and was really just about war profiteering. And so they wanted it to keep going forever. And the objectives that they had claimed uh, to bring freedom had nothing to do with it. It was about opium and a lot more. Quite frankly, what Daniel Ellsberg talked about pales in significance to Seabell Edmonds, a FBI translator uh, going over top you know, security clearance, NSA intercepts, um, she went to work for him three days after 9-11, and she looked at intercepts from the mid-90s right up until 9-11. And what she saw blew her away. She went to Congress and was gagged. The information that um, she was able to see confirms everything that we've reverse engineered on the outside, that 9-11 was a synthetic false flag staged event, Al-Qaeda, is a creation of Western intelligence to menace the West so they can take our liberties, but also bring down other regimes in the area that try to be more sensible and build up their society. The jihadis uh, basically are a group just turned loose by the globalists, the banking interests that dominate our country and Europe, to destroy Arab and Muslim nations that try to build up. And that's the whole history. You know, they admit Mujahideen was founded by the CIA, but it's a lot deeper than that. Look at how Al-Qaeda has been used. You know, one thing Bush said was, the terrorist attacked us because they had our freedom. And the people with Bush and now Obama have destroyed our liberties and our freedoms to a cartoon level. I mean, it's, it's so off the charts. It's like a comic book or something. NDAA, secret arrests, light posts that listen to you, drones in the skies, TSA, you know, molesting people. I guess the terrorists really did attack us because they hated our freedom. The military industrial complex controlled by foreign banks they attacked us through their proxies that took the blame because they did hate our freedom. It's actually true. The terrorists did attack us. It's the criminal elements of the government and the mega corporations who are the terrorists, and they do hate our freedoms because our freedoms and our Bill of Rights and due process would put all of them in jail for the insider trading, the trillions in banker bailouts, and the looting and criminality we see right now. And all over the world, an iron curtain of tyranny is descending over nations under the guise of 9-11 and terrorism. But in the front of the paper, not even in the back, they admit Al-Qaeda are heroes in Libya, funded by NATO, the CIA, Mossad, and others. And now in Syria, the U.S. ambassador rice uh, to the U.N., she said two weeks ago, she said, Assad, there'll be more bombings of your government buildings if you don't step down. And who's bombing them? Al-Qaeda. Trained in Turkey and other areas and brought in by the United States, the so-called U.S., the criminals that have hijacked us. And all this is done in our name. The lady we're about to talk to is an inside whistleblower who witnessed this, and they've threatened her with jail time for violating national security. That national security now means their criminal actions. If she exposes who al-Qaeda was really working for on 9-11, and she has a new book out that we're going to be telling you about as well, uh, but even the ACLU calls her uh, the, the most classified woman uh, and one of the biggest whistleblowers in history. And again, we have to pray for her and support her and get her book because she is right now facing the potential of them threatening to come arrest her for publishing this book. Seabell, good to have you on with us. Thank you for having me on again, Alex. Well, we had you on the radio yesterday, but now I just want to sit back and I've got some questions later, but in the next 15 minutes or so, you've got the floor. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Start with a question, and I'll get well, going. Well, just tell people how it all began. I, I mean, because last time I directed the questions, in this interview, I want you to be able, you know, if you were addressing millions of people, which you are, I'm asking you, what would you say to them? What's most important in your huge story that's been confirmed? Well, the most important thing is what is our government doing? What has it been doing? And why they have been covering up what they have been doing for so long? Because, you know, if you're not engaged in something really wrong, outrageous, you won't have this need to cover up. 
you won't have to classify 5 million documents every single day. That's what they do. There are billions of documents. These are government documents. This is the, supposed to be the government of the people, for the people, by the people. So if you have billions of documents kept secret, if you have the government who issues gag orders on government insiders who come forward and dare to report on government's own wrongdoing, criminal operations, criminal activities, waste, fraud, abuse. How can this government be a government of the people, for the people, by the people? You have all these classification, all these cover-ups. You have gag orders. We have had, since Obama became president, we have had seven government whistleblowers prosecuted. Look. Even Dan Ellsberg didn't go to jail. And guess what? Outside Dan Ellsberg, we haven't had a whistleblower that has been indicted, ever. And just in this short period, we have had this president, the so-called liberal president, that has convicted seven, seven government whistleblowers. Their crime? coming out, letting the pub public know that their government is engaged in criminal activities all over the world and here in the United States, whether it's torture, whether billions of dollars, billions of dollars, that all these people who can't afford in our country to pay for their medical bills, okay? Look at the state of our schools, our libraries, and our government, with all this deficit that we have, Alex, I, you know it. I mean, I don't want to be preaching to the choir here. It's wasting every month billions of dollars. You know why? Because it is not accountable. One of the, one of the examples I give people is if you witness a crime, you know, murder, burglary, what do you do? Usually you go and take, up, you know, take out your cell phone and you call the police. What if you witness your government, the police is committing some heinous crime? Who do you have to call? If you look at the federal courts since 9-11, find one case where the federal court has not sided with the government and helped the government cover up, whether by accepting secrecy and state secrets privilege or just plain going and indict a, a, a whistleblower. And they have a name for that. It's called, <laughs> it's called tyranny. Uh, please continue. It is. it is. And you know, when we come, whether we the government insiders who have come out and they say we blew the whistle, we basically told the people what we saw being done to our national security, to our welfare, national welfare by our own government, that if, if you, co you come out and say it, you say it in your show every day. I say it, right? They call us the radicals, the nutcases. The, these are the, uh, oh, these are the marginal people. Uh, there are 9-11 cooks. Oh, the other one is a conspiracy theorist. They have now put millions of Americans in this bucket with the help of the mainstream media. And I always add, Alex, with the help of the alternative, quasi-alternative media. A lot of people think, oh yeah, well, I'm not reading Washington Post or New York Times. I am reading so-and-so. Go look who is funding so-and-so. It's actually on their website. If it says Rockefeller and Soros and Carnegie, are you reading alternative views and news? Are you under that illusion? So when I say with the media, they are, because more and more people are waking up and the number is increasing, the number that our government and our media designate as nutcases, conspiracy theorists. That's what we are, millions of us. You know, it's like the story of this king and this poisoned well. And those who refused to drink the poisoned water and then go crazy were being pointed out to and say, you know, people, majority, 95, look at these crazy people. Well, we haven't been drinking the government poisoned water. And because of that, we are being persecuted. We are being marginalized. And, and this is what this book is about. A lot of, unfortunately, whistleblowers, they, and this is also by design by many of these nonprofit organizations, industrial complex, because they have become an industry. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars 
are being poured by those big 1% into these so-called NGOs. And these NGOs have uh, not secret, open partnership with the government. They want whistleblowers to whine and to come out and say, I'm a victim, look at me, look what they've done to me. They ruined my life. Did they ruin my life? Yes. Did they fire me? Yes. But what I did with this book was to show people what government tried to do to the American people, what it has been doing to the American people, taking away their right to know. Because as long as people are uninformed, they can go on. They have actually, they have been expanding. So I put in this one book, the book that government has been fighting for 383 days now. They have been saying, you are not allowed to publish a single word in this book. My attorneys and I kept sending letters to them saying, cite a law. Oh, well, we're going to cite the classification. We have to redact and we have to redact everything. I said, well, you had 30 days to do that. We are moving forward. We are armed, you know, with our, by our First Amendment is on our side. And we're going to do it because we have to push it. Every time we have an opportunity, we have to push it. If we sit, if we just sit and take it, every day is going to get worse. Today. They started by having us remove our shoes, Alex. But you know, one of the things that for me it's ironic is if you step back and look at people removing their shoes, what do you see? We actually bend over, right? This is like bending over before the kings. There they are, the government batch people. We are untying our shoes, bending over, taking, removing our shoes. Psychologically, they are training us to see them as the superior gods, you know, like the Greek gods. Well, they what about the famous photos in, in film of, of people in Nazi Germany stripping down and, and going into the facilities? It is psychological warfare. You take the shoes off, then it's the belt off the coat. Now we're going to put you in a scanner. Now we're going to touch you on top of the scanner. Now we're going to go in your pants. Now we're going to make Miss USA cry. Now we're going to take your child, your two-year-old, as they scream away, and we're going to strip search them behind closed doors. Now we're going to take old ladies behind closed doors. We're going to exercise power over you. It's totally clear the terrorists attacked us because they hate our freedom. The terrorists are the people that hijacked our government. But for people that don't know who you are, or have just seen the headlines in the news, recap the, you know, the fact that there you were as a language specialist for the FBI at the highest levels of national security, looking at all these NSA intercepts. You, know, you had these degrees. Uh, you know, you, uh, you believe in the system, you said yesterday on the radio. You go to work and then walk people through the process of telling Congress what happened. And for those that don't know, when you've worked in the national security system, which is actually the national tyranny system, you know, secure the criminal takeover, but you don't know it. When you work in there, now you've signed all these agreements. So you're one of the few whistleblowers to go public at this level. And they are threatening you right now. That's very important. Because they want to set some sort of a precedence. They did it with my case, Alex, with state secrets privilege. As you said, I took the job and you know how 20 years, 15 years later, they were so open our government saying, oh yeah, we worked with the Taliban and Al Qaeda, including bin Laden in 1980s, because that was when we had this big grand cold war. We were trying to defeat the Soviet. So we forged these partnerships. They ended there. I went to work for the FBI and I dealt with these operations, investigations of operations that dealt uh, with the time frame 1996 till 2001, these operations, these files, under FBI's counterintelligence and counterespionage investigations under those two units. And not only me, but with the agents who also knew this, they were also aggravated by this. They were also outraged by this. You could see that, well, the Cold War never ended. Those partnerships never ended. In 1996, you know, until 2001, until right after September 11, we were still partners with the same organizations. You know, these factions from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt. And what we were doing, we were creating, and I believe we are still doing that, 
I have been out of the FBI, but I don't believe that they stopped these operations and creating terror cells put them in Central Asia and Caucasus. These uh, resource-rich, oil-rich, natural gas-rich region that used to be part of the Soviet Union, <coughs> Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So it never ended. That partnership never ended. And they were working with Zawahiri, Ayman Zawahiri. They were working with Bin Laden. They were working with several other groups that were from uh, Middle East, including governmental groups, including you know certain faction of Pakistani government, to very openly create terror cells in Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. And this went on till 9-11 and then continued until February 2002. February 2002 is, was when, for the first time, I went outside the FBI, went to the Inspector General's office, I went to Congress. And these operations, if they continued before 9-11 and after 9-11, that story does not match the story of bin Laden is most wanted. We have this war against Al-Qaeda. By the way, they never refer to them as Al-Qaeda. It was never Al-Qaeda. Within these operation files that we had in the FBI, it was never. We actually said bin Laden groups, and bin Laden was plural. It was not only Osama bin Laden. There were four other bin Laden families, some of them from U.S., $150 million together with certain prints, together with two people from State Department, 1998, going to Azerbaijan for the opening of five mosques, mosques and madrasas combined. These are the religious schools. They, they were together in this partnership. They, were, they established over 300, 300 madrasas and mosques combined because some of these madrasas are part of these mosques. They built 300 mosques in Central Asia and Caucasus in six years. You want to see the documents? They are not hiding. They can classify mosques. Go find out who paid for those mosques, Alex. Not the people in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. No, U.S. taxpayers. This even came out in the Washington Post shortly after 9-11. And heroin money. And heroin money. Because they, they keep giving this story to people about... On one hand, they come and they say, currently, the uh, opium production, the value, street value is somewhere between 100 and $150 billion, okay? This is Time Magazine, these disgusting people, Time Magazine. Then they have this picture of these really uh, bearded guys in Afghanistan, you know, with their white shalwar. They are the farmers. So they want to give this illusion that $150 billion industry is operated by these guys. By these guys, most of them can't write, read, read. They don't have bank accounts, Alex. And that's the picture they show you. This $150 billion industry involves banks, involves military planes, involves private planes to transport, involves labs. Those labs, they need chemicals. Okay, they need equipment. How can a guy in a shawar produce, let's put hundreds, let's put 5,000 of them. And if that's the case, the street value is $150 billion, Alex. Well, the GDP of Afghanistan currently is $4 billion. $3 billion of it comes from us directly. A, obviously, it is not in Afghan economy. Well, Seabell, let me just stop you right there. because Don't be because that question though in the media. Sure. No, that's, that's, uh, that's important. Let me just stop you right there because you're somebody who was seeing all these communiques and, and that confirms what we know now. But why are they trying to block your book when it was first being published when now everything you're saying for 10 years is mainstream news? I mean, it's hidden in the news, but it's like, yes, NATO is funding Al Qaeda to take over Libya and Syria. And yes, opium production is now 93% of world production in Afghanistan from less than 10%. And they have the troops on TV saying we're forced to grow the opium. They don't even hide it. And you're using the old argument you know, people used decades ago of hundreds of billions of drug money. It's being laundered by the big banks. Now it's come out that Wachovia and Wells Fargo and all these guys are laundering the money. It's not even hidden. So people always say, well, there'd be whistleblowers if something like this was happening. There they are. Have, they, you have had several whistleblowers. Exactly. We've had whistleblowers. 
this is going on. It's clear what's happening, but specifically, getting into the communiques, uh, you know, right up, up because you were on my show a few years ago, and you said when you started, first started, you know, breaking your gag order, you said the West was commanding Al Qaeda, including senior people, right up until 9/11. So, so I mean, I want you to go into that. And you talked about money, guns, drugs, things like that, the types of things you saw going on. You said that, and, and, and before I get into that, Alex, you say, well, everybody knows, so what's the big deal? 98% of people don't. Alex, you may be fortunate to be surrounded by people who are informed. They are the ones who go to real alternatives. Okay, so let's say you have one or two or three million listeners, who people who go and read, that's it. And take a look at that percentage. I mean, those people who are tuning into Larry King, the ones at the airport, they're rushing through and buying uh, Newsweek and Time magazines. My neighbors, my neighbor's friends, my, my, my daughter's friend's mother, they don't know. In fact, you won't believe this. Nobody knows in my neighborhood that who's Savelle Edmonds. They've never heard of it. Yeah, I wasn't CBS 60 Minutes. Somebody may recall there was some FBI whistleblower, but you, you're talking about these issues, and thanks to the quasi-alternative media and the mainstream media, you're looking at a very small percentage who read, let's say, Peter Dale Scott, and they listen to your shows, and they are, you know, they're exposed to what we're exposing. Thankfully, the number is going up. You know, this is why I started my site as well. The, and, but with this book, with this book, the government knows this is not a mainstream book. This book, nobody can see it in bookstores. You know why? Because the top tier publishers, they said, oh, we believe it will sell very good, but we're not going to touch this. At this point, this case is still in some ways hot. We don't want to be in the wrong side of the FBI. Another publisher said, you know, American people, they, they like to read on, in political books like this one side or another. It's either Republican or if it's Democrat. You're coming and trashing all of them, saying they're all corrupt, they're all awful. Well, that doesn't Well, happen. yeah, you're exposing, like Ron that. Paul, the whole phony game, but more and more the people do know the emperor is wearing no clothes. But, I mean, let's be specific. You tried to go through the establishment route. The FBI was supposed to have a month to either cut stuff out or argue that. They sat on a year. Go over the threats you've gone through, that whole that whole process. Sure. See, I started working with the FBI three days after 9-11. This is uh, September 14, September 15, 2001. I am naive. I have a master's degree in public policy. I'm a first generation immigrant. I'm a great believer of this great nation of separation of powers and, and system of checks and balances, freedom. I mean, here, I, mean, I was active, my family, I and mean, if you read this book, you, you understand where I come from. My father was tortured by Iran's Shah, okay? His toenails were pulled. He was a surgeon. He was a doctor. Do you know why, Alex? Because in his possession, he had two books. One of them was Steinbach, okay? So that's what, that landed my father in jail. Uh, so I come from that background. I thought I'm in a country, all I have to do, like most Americans, the, I go and vote every four years. Everything seems to be taken care of, like many Americans believe, just eat hot dogs, it's 4th of July, yeehaw, just celebrate. Well, that was the mentality I had when I went working for the FBI. And, and I signed these documents, classification documents, saying you are getting top secret clearance. Anytime during your life, not only when you're working for the FBI, if you ever write anything that is nonfiction related to the FBI and what you saw here, what you worked on here, has to be vetted by us. You have to submit it to us, the government, the Justice Department, FBI. We'll go through it with our marker. And my God, we are God because we are not answerable to anyone. And we redact. You can't say this. You can't say this. Oh, this is highly embarrassing. You can't say this either. Then he can go fight it in court. Go spend three hundred thousand dollars. Get attorneys who are charging four hundred, you know, five hundred dollars per hour. Fight for years. I signed it, and I didn't even think about it twice. Today, this is just a side note, Alex. We have over six, seven million people in America who have, you know, top secret clearance. 
they don't realize what they have done. These people who are signing because they're contractor with the government. I mean, I, I know guys who are the computer technicians, but because they do something in Langley, they have to sign this, this documents meaning they don't realize that they are signing away their First Amendment right. So those documents are illegal, not illegal maybe, but unconstitutional in the first place. Who says that you have to give up? It's one thing to say you cannot disclose methods of intelligence gathering, be specific, but they are not specific in these documents. Anyhow, I went in there green, idealistic. I started working and I started seeing these uh, issues. Some of them were major bureaucratic bunglings and competence related. Others were pure criminal espionage related. And of course, the most important ones dealt with these operations that were being shut down. And this is FBI's investigation of it by the State Department and the CIA, because FBI wanted to pursue these cases, believe me or not. Uh, not guys like Mueller on the top, okay? They are part of the same corrupt, rotten system. You're looking at agents level, you know, these guys, they felt patriotic. They were outraged. They were, excuse my language, they were pissed that the CIA and the State Department was was ruling the FBI saying- Well, that's what oh, I found. Gonna... That's what I found in 17 years of investigating government and corporate crime at every level. Generally, the men and women at the grassroots are really good, dedicated people, and they're either really naive and buy into the false narrative they're given to carry out tyranny, or it's their job and their career, and they got kids, so they just kind of keep quiet but never go up the chain because they won't do bad stuff. I know some Austin police who are really good guys, and they wouldn't do things that they see are, you know, is illegal, and so they got busted down from, like, detectives to back down to beat cops. I mean, it's just like the movies. It's just like Serpico. And we just need to realize it's getting worse. The corrupt and the national security state since 47. Unlimited money, unlimited secrecy. They're running the drugs. They're running the child kidnapping. They're running it all. And we have all the other whistleblowers uh, from government and FBI agents with the hijackers training at military bases and training and, hey, they want to fly into buildings. Those were people testing security, we've learned. They were agents trained at bases who were set up themselves. Uh, you know, hey, let's see if you can get to the airport and get on the plane. We know Ada and others have been doing that for months before. I've talked to the head of the U.S. Embassy, Springman, who later learned that they were flagged as al-Qaeda but told, let them into the U.S., this is about 10 months before 9-11 when they were coming back in from an al-Qaeda summit. They thought they were double agents. They were told, oh, there's CIA, let them in. The underwear bomber, gotten on the plane by the U.S. government, that's admitted. Uh, C-SPAN, State Department hearings. Uh, the latest guy, CIA double agent. Well, first it was, oh, Al-Qaeda. They find out he's CIA. They go, yes, double agent. I mean, it's purely manufactured. And that's what's sick. They're not only killing millions of people in Iraq and overseas and all this. That's, that's bad. But they really do want to overthrow the U.S. and make us slaves as well. So for yuppies and people, they go, ah, oh, so what if we kill the Arabs or whatever, you know, because they're racist or whatever. Understand, folks, good old boys, you're next. The, now we're told the threat's domestic. It's the libertarians. It's the Ron Pauls. It's the Alex Joneses. It's the whistleblowers. They don't care about Iraqis. They don't care about Afghans or folks in Pakistan. They don't care about anybody, and they really hate America. These foreign banks that have hijacked America, Cibel, they, I mean, you've been in the middle of it, but they're admitting Goldman Sachs has conquered Europe. Now they're conquering us through fraud. This is global corporate ruthless espionage where they're attacking everybody and playing us off against each other and making money off all sides. It's full spectrum dominance. And when the Pentagon talks about that, they don't just mean air, sea, land, you know, cyber, all that propaganda, psyop, info war. They really mean they even create the enemy. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's full spectrum dominance. And they even soft kill the troops with vaccines. And DU, they know, is going to kill them. I mean, this is, this is masterfully done. Absolutely. So these agents, they were on our side. But as you said, the agent that one particular agent that I worked with, and he was outraged, he was disgusted. In fact, he was the one who actually first tried to expose some of these issues. He said, my wife is not working, okay? She, she, she's a homemaker. I have two daughters, three years old and five years old. I, I, I can't lose this job. 
You un you don't you understand? Plus, even if we were to go out and blow the whistle, do you think anybody is going to do anything about it? And this was when he told me. He said, "You and I know from our own investigations, our units' investigations of twelve, thirteen elected representatives who are criminals, all criminals. Okay, they accept foreign bribery. They." The ones involved in Chicago, two of them, they actually dealt directly with the heroin uh, mob in, in Chicago, in yeah. Illinois. So we know of 13. How many do you think other units have under them that they have exposed? So if you're going to go to Congress and report Sabelle, how are you going to determine who's clean? How you are going to determine that? At the time, I thought he was jaded. At the time, I thought he was being too cynical. Because I was naive. I mean, I was naive <laughs> in every step. Because even after my eyes were open, as far as Congress was concerned, I was following these issues in courts because I believed in federal courts. Then my eyes were open after that process. And after that, it was the non-governmental industrial complex, the NGOs, the whistleblower organization, the civil liberties related organizations, and the whole dynamics there. And of course, the mainstream media. So I just, I got crash education and it contradicted everything I studied for my master's degree in the university this year. Everything no, I was- No, it's all a false web, literally Absolutely. a false habitat of false opposition, false groups. Uh, so everything falls in. They've got it all worked out in a multifaceted level, but there's a giant grassroots. For my research, I got to tell you, I'm one of the few only real things that's large and, and not controlled. Ron Paul, he really won the first primaries. He would be the nominee. He'd be the president. They stopped they him. That happen. They will fight it. They've been fighting it. Out of all the people for the past 11 years, I said, I will not even look at any of these politicians except for Ron Paul. He's the only one. He's been the only one. And look, it's the government and it's their mouthpiece, the mainstream media and the quasi-alternative media. The false reporting is just a it's, you You think that people would see that these people are making a gigantic fool out of themselves. I mean, here, like he's a second, they skip number two. They go to three, four, five. This tells you how threatened the establishment is from this man because he is just like the whistleblowers. He's exception to the rule, okay? He's the only one in Congress that I know of. Maybe there are others, but I haven't come across any of them. And he's been like this sore, and they don't know how to get rid of him. So they are trying, they are trying very hard, but also the harder they try, the more obvious becomes that how threatened they are by, by, by this one man which tells you the power of it. This is why I get upset because I'm talking with these people, Alex, and they say, well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, if you're going to be either Romney or Obama. And I say, why don't you vote third candidate, an alternative? They, they automatically, they say, oh, they're not electables. I say, who says so? And they can't explain. Do you know why? They don't know why they are saying it. They see it on the media. They see it in the newspaper. They hear it every day. Oh, uh, Larry King, oh yeah, even when they say Ron Paul is cool, I like him, but of course he's not electable. Well, you say that 100 times a day, people are going to start like parrots repeating it. And so when I grill them, I say, why do you think he's not electable? What if you and everyone who says Ron Paul is not electable, a third party, third candidate, independent is not electable, go and cast a vote and say, I'm going to do it because I'm disgusted with the two anyway. I'm not going to take the lesser of the two evils because what is it? One, one ranks 100 in the, in the scale of being evil, and the other one ranks 99. I'm going to vote for the other guy who's 99% evil. Great. That's not the mentality we need. What will happen if you cast vote and everybody who says that there is this, again, media, education system, universities, the academia, they repeat it. This is like brainwashing. So people walking around like robots saying, Oh, I think Ron Paul is a great guy, but he's not electable. Why? Well, you know, he's just not electable. He's just too different and he doesn't, but they can't really put anything. Then some of the other ones, they say things like this. Oh, because he's racist. I say, really? Leslie, I come from Middle Eastern background. I'm female. 
What makes you say Ron Paul is racist? Give me an example. They say, oh, I don't remember. I read New York Times said how he's been, he's with the skinheads. You see, this is the psychological warfare. This is the op, the psyops. Psyops are not geared for Iraq or Afghanistan. The psyops happening here with elections in the United States on daily basis. How many people are exposing that we are under psyops? And you know what, when you and I say this, Alex, not cases. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones was interviewing conspiracy nutcase about Edmonds. And they said, we have this great scheme. Well, it is a great scheme. Because when I hear people repeat these things, when I ask them why and they can't answer, they've been programmed. Who programmed them? You tell me, Alex. You know this. Well, you're right. It's, it's true. And they just use these little throwaway terms. But then you've got things like Building 7. The list just goes on and on. Uh, but, but, but people are waking up more and more to the fact that they're being lied to. They just feel powerless. And as more whistleblowers go public, uh, sure, slowly but surely, now it's accelerating, more have the courage to come forward. I mean, obviously... Alex, uh, I don't know. I mean, you are right. More and more people are, are waking up. I agree with you. But whistleblowers, this man, Obama, has done more damage to, 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 to the, for these people, truth tellers to come from inside the government than any other president. Sure, but they why are you going public then? I mean, they wouldn't have special because, NSA units. Because I want to set an example, okay? I want to say, stand up, do it. Because some people did it. When I did it in 2002, I wasn't alone. So many other courageous people, they did similar things. I had people from TSA send me documents. I had people from, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the DIA contact me and, and then I would get some of that. In. I, ha I haven't had that. People are so scared in government. They're saying, this guy jails us because next he's going to start sending us to Guantanamo. Well, listen, a, na a nation of sheep will be ruled uh, by wolves. And uh, I got sent, you know, I get sent documents uh, and, you know, where they're creating re-education camps and we release them. And uh, you know what? I say make them start arresting people more. Make them get those camps going. Let's just get this out in the open. They want to grow this slow, Sibel. That's, and that's why I don't think they're going to go after you because they don't want to make you a martyr. That's very true because they do. They haunt one, put it in jail, and then six months later another. This is why I was saying with the mass protest, when I, when I say revolution and pitchfork, people, they think um, I'm talking about violence. I am not, okay? But people then, I have friends who are activists, they say, yeah, we have to do more of Gandhi stuff. Maybe we all get together and have kumbaya and stand on our head and do yoga and stretch. And I don't have anything against yoga. But what would Gandhi do if his daughter is being raped in front of him, okay? For me, the, I, I am not being dramatic yet. I have a daughter, she's three and a half years old. She's my life, okay? Alex, she's my life. And I go to airport and somebody wants to, but I have been teaching my daughter, they don't, nobody touches you. Mommy can touch you, mommy can dress you. And some people go and try to put their hands on my daughter. That is, that is raping my daughter. I mean, raping is not an act that has to involve certain technicalities. To me, that is, Equal, that equals rape, okay? And people now are, are, are standing back and they're like, okay, I don't like it, but it's new. No, no, but, that, but listen, they admit it's, it's getting us ready yes. for forced inoculations. It's getting us it ready is, for political arrest. Is, they use, G, they and use, you know, but I'm sorry, I can't do yoga and do kumbaya and, and, and do the chanting and say, hopefully it will change. I go to my ex professors in universities. You know what they say, Alex? They say, this is American politics. There is this pendulum that swings this way and this way. So it's going to swing back. Yeah, I, this pendulum has been going one way for a long time. Okay, it hasn't been swinging back and forth. That's because they're but, ramming it through in a c controlled this global is the corporate this takeover. Is the intelligentsia. This is the intelligentsia that we have here. If our professors, they say, chant, wait for the pendulum swing back that way. And I say, no, grab your pitchfork symbolically, okay? Get out. Go claim back your liberties for your children, for your husband, for your wife, for your for, for your parents. Because, because as a nation, we are being raped every day. That TSA is only one, as you said. What they do in the schools, that's another way. What they do, you are talking on the phone and they are listening to you. Everybody now knows it, but 
they stopped screaming about it. It made the splash, Alex, when NSA's illegal eavesdropping of all American communication came out. Six months later, it became a fact of life. They, they rape your privacy on the phone. They rape your privacy on the email. They rape your daughter in the airport. They rape your son in schools. How long are you gonna sit and put up with being raped? And every month, like good little sheep, go and pay your taxes and say, I give you the money, rape me please. And when people say, you gonna stop this? Get their pitchfork, get out there and say, we've had it. Well, look, absolutely. I've studied history, and if people at this point stand up and believe they can change it, then it reverses. But the way we're going, if people give in to the fear, then the tyranny wins, and it's going to be really hardcore. I've analyzed this, Cibel, and I want to get your take on this tyranny. This is a scientific world government eugenics plan. It's a scientific plan, and that's why the pendulum won't ever swing back, because it's being driven by a juggernaut of narcotics money, Federal Reserve money. It's here. They've committed so many crimes in the ruling elite that they're all going to go to prison if they don't win. So they've got to bring in a total technocracy, in their words, and eradicate all forms of human liberty. This is for everything. This is for all the marbles. Uh, that's why the Russians, and they're corrupt in their own right, are having to say, uh, Medvedev yesterday, their, their chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff last week, they said, prepare for nuclear war. You're moving weapons in. You're moving al-Qaeda in to attack us. We're going to have to launch nukes into your uh, Western Europe. The Russians didn't talk like that in the middle of the Cold War. Because back then, the banks were funding them, and there was more of an inside deal. This, this is serious. And these crazy bankers, like Corzine, making 40 to 1 bets in MF Global with people's private accounts, he gets caught, gets caught lying in Congress, and it's just like, that's the way it is. So, I mean, the elite have done like Hitler attacking North Africa, attacking Russia, attacking England, att declaring war on the U.S. You know, and Hitler just, I mean, uh, so many others in history, we see uh, Napoleon doing the same thing. These guys have some victories, and it's megalomania. Nero went crazy. Um, Caligula went crazy. I'm telling you, Sabel, they have gone nuts. They have gone crazy. The ruling elite doesn't even care if Fukushima's got... So hubris, because... They are seeing it this way. Who can challenge us? I mean, really. And as you said, it's global. When uh, you're looking, I give you an example with Libya. It is the collusion between, it, it's, it's the whole gang. It's NATO going and doing its part, coming out. And then now, I mean, go look at just in the past few months, which companies have gone into Libya taking over the oil wells and the oil deals, it's UK and US. And then the banks, they're sort of putting the bills. It's a team. It takes the whole village. It's, it's the village of, you're looking at the military part of it, you know, NATO and the CIA, you know, all the black ops and the mercenaries, that's the military arms. Then there is the money, banking, financial part of it. And then you have these politicians worldwide, whether it's uh, in France or if it's in Germany or if it's in the UK or if it's in Australia or here. That, that, it's, you know, I mean, people are talking about Bilderberg. It's a club. It's the global club. And and the victims are the people of the world. I mean, it's not like, oh, uh, of course, some are far worse victims than, than in more, far worse situation that we are. Because, you know, to turn on the TV, one girl, American girl or boy, baby, child is lost or taken away or abducted or killed. I mean, it's heartbreaking. We are airing it months for months and they go take the drone out there drop in there and go take a look at the pictures the one that mainstream will never ever ever publish ever publish since vietnam they haven't they haven't been publishing our victims pictures and these charcoal kids not once a month every single day okay put those show those on tv when we say, oh, we had three drone attacks and we killed three Al-Qaeda's. I'm like, okay, how do you determine these are Al-Qaeda? Do they carry IDs, badges? Oh, we got two more Al-Qaeda here. Yo, add it there. Is that how they determined they were Al-Qaeda? Or before they shoot them, this guy walking around waving Al-Qaeda flag, wearing Al-Qaeda badge? Come on. Who says these people that we are killing, three of them were Al-Qaeda? Prove it. You never see that. When you read newspapers, I wrote a piece about this on Boiling Frost Post. 
Every day we are killing so many, so many Al Qaeda's. Who says they are Al Qaeda? Mainstream media seeks what kind of evidence, okay? What makes them Al Qaeda? And all those little babies, children, just count the numbers, show them every day to the American well, people. Well, listen, uh, Bell, I have talked to high level people at CNN and Fox, as well as MSNBC over the years, and they've told me it's exactly like you say. I've talked to high level people. They, they tell them, listen, you want to pay for your kids? You want your million dollars a year? Shut up and don't criticize the system. And when they do stuff, you laugh about it and act like you like it. Or you can get your stuff and your contract's gone. And they point blank tell them. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the ruling class and even the mid-level minions, they, a lot of them, they know what it is and they've just decided, well, okay, we'll do it. But they don't understand history. Then the worst of the worst compete and get in control. And it becomes a synthesis of pure evil. And pretty soon the worst of the worst are in. And every culture does this, from the Aztecs to the Babylonians to the Nazi Germans to the communists. Every culture, when this corruption thing happens, it rolls downhill until they're ordering the firstborn young to be given to the government as an act of fealty to be sacrificed. I mean, most cultures, the government would order your firstborn killed as an exercise of power. I mean, that's what human sacrifice was, was just a raw exercise of power by the priest class. And that's what this is. I mean, it is, I, I've studied so much history and anthropology and sociology and archaeology and, and, and primitive cultures. And when, when, when humans go bad, we really go bad. And a new dark age is here. And it's, it's, it's whistleblowers that have the light of liberty in their hearts and minds and eyes, Seabell, that are going to lead us out of this. And I, I hope and pray your courage is a example to others because we have nothing to lose. There, there is no future for our children if we don't beat this. So just commit to it, own it, love it, stand up, and you'll truly be alive. I bet, uh, Seabell, even though you've been through all this persecution, that you feel more alive than you ever have before. Now, I'm throwing that out there because I know I do. Uh, I mean, uh, c compared to yourself, say, 11 years ago, what type of person are you now? Despite all the sufferings and everything, I believe today I'm a stronger person. Some people would call me more cynical. I would kind of call myself more realist, okay? More alive. And more alive. More awake. It is. And one other thing, you know, and this is one of the things I tell people who accuse me of being unpatriotic, saying things like this, criticizing U.S. government. I say, you know, today, if, if they were around, let's say if we had Thomas Jefferson, he would be on no-fly list. He would be one of the first to be picked up under NDAA and placed in Guantanamo. You know, just like, uh, you know, what you're talking about, Ron Paul, Thomas Jefferson would be considered domestic terrorist. That's the kind of a government... No, 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 I have FEMA on video teaching police of, that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were bad. They actually oh, say right. to cops <laughs> with a straight face. And I've that, given the number out when I've played that video on the radio and TV, and unlimited police call and they go, yeah, we got that exact training. They sit there and they're watching the cops to see who says that's wrong and putting them on a list and they don't get promoted. If you don't hate George Washington, you don't get promoted in the police force now. I'm not kidding. I have a whistleblower, I have a whistleblower air marshal, okay? And he said it's part of the policy there for air marshals, and it's for the rest of TSA, but he knows about air marshals. If they indicate that they are libertarians, they are there for the libertarian party, they are not granted clearance. They make other excuses not to give them, but they say, and this is the Department of Homeland Security, those who believe in libertarian parties are terrorist anarchists. So therefore, they have to lie. They say, you know, they're independent, but if they find out, that you're libertarian in terms of the big L. You know, I, I have libertarian leaning. Again, you just dropped a bombshell here. We always think of discrimination as <laughs> sexual or, or, or <laughs> racial. Get this air marshal on your show. I believe I can persuade him. Decorated veteran. He's been, you know, before with the military. He got disgusted. He got out uh, about a year and a half ago. And he is a uh, little L libertarian, not the party, but he's libertarian minded. 
But this is, and he's not lying, and I believe I can persuade him, he will come. And as I said, he's decorated. He's a very respected individual, and he hasn't been really public before. But that's what, they, they won't hire you. They won't give you clearance. Because well, let's get him on next week, because I was just going to make the point. We think of, and the media harps on discrimination is racial or, or religious or sexual. And sure, all that goes on. Instead of thinking, okay, Obama shut down coal power plants that, that his buddies didn't owe, uh, own, but he gave waivers to General Electric, or he gave waivers to 2,000 companies to not get health insurance for their employees, but the little hamburger shack that can't afford it, they have to and go out of business. That's the real discrimination, and I've been told that, uh, but that's a big national, that's a Pulitzer Prize that needs to come out, that if you're a libertarian or you're a Ron Paul supporter, you don't get clearance, you don't get the job. They use that national security state, and now they're saying if they put you on a no-fly list, no judge, no jury, that you won't be able to buy a gun. I mean, this the national security tyranny isn't just going to let the crooks do what they want now. Now they're going to tell us in the national security state, we can't leave the U.S., we can't fly, we can't have a job, we can't travel. It's not just going to be the feds that get blackballed if they're not tyrants. It's the general public, Seabell. It certainly is. And, you know, one of the other examples I like to give people is I... Uh, we had, we would, I would complain about TSA, write about it. And remember that lady, that old lady whose diaper had to be removed, she was humiliated. You remember that case, right, Alex? And I tell people, I bet you one day, one hour before that incident happened, that lady, if she would have heard me talk about it, or you, Alex, would say, oh, well, we had terrorist attack. These men, young men are doing their jobs until it happened to her. And then she stood up and she said, this is tyranny, this is despicable, this is humiliating. Do we have to wait for these things to happen to every single one or majority of our people? Well, see, Can't we just watch others and say, that's like happening to me or to my kid? Why do we have to wait until it happens to us? You're right. This has been an epic discussion, and I want to have you back, and I'd love to have you uh, on via Skype, and then the, you know, the other guy on the phone, or both of you on Skype. I would love to have that whistleblower on, and other whistleblowers you'd like to bring forward, because I'm not scared. I'm only, not because I'm a tough guy. I've studied history. I'm scared of giving in to these people and the world they're going to create for everybody. And we only have the liberties we have because people fought hard for them. And I know there's good people in the government and corporate America. I know they're everywhere. Sometimes I paint with a broad brush because the system itself is broken. And I'm tired of saying, oh, well, there's some good people, and but there's some bad or good apples, bad apples. The bad apples are all at the top. So the whole system has been taken over. And now Newsweek and Times say the Constitution's bad and it did this. No, we got rid of it and we didn't defend it. And we let them eat little holes in it because, oh, it was just a little bit. Now it's all gone. It's, 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 it's running like blood out of us. This country's going into shock. We're dying. And, and this is an epic moment. We've got to stand up and say no or we're going to lose everything. The criminal element is robbing everything. They seek in their own words a post-industrial world where they use poverty as a tool of control. This is, this is scientifically deployed and developed evil. They admit it in their own words. The think tanks, you know, write this stuff like we're not reading it because the general public is asleep, mesmerized in this false paradigm. But the, but the, there can be a chain reaction. It's already begun through people like you, Seabell, and others, and we're going to continue it. And your courage is a beacon. Two minute closing comment. Well, this you basically cited the reason of why, after all these years, I decided to challenge the government and come out and write this book, Classified Woman. I wrote it, I challenged not only the government, I'm still challenging them. I challenged the establishment, the 1%, the corporate, mega corporate publishers. And right now I'm challenging the mainstream media and the quasi alternative. You were gracious to give me the forum and let me talk about these issues. Tell people about this case, about what it means to our country, about classified women, the book, and and they're watching you, Alex. I, I think a lot of people, those quasi's, they are currently outraged because they wanted they wanted this, like many other issues, many other cases, to just die down, go unnoticed, so they can go and sell these fantasies to people, all these all these baloney fantasies. So, so you are challenging. You've been challenging them every day. I wrote this book to challenge them. I am challenging it. People who get this book, Classified Woman, and read it, when you get it, you're getting directly from me. There are no other publishers. There are no corporate. 
there is nothing. It's just, it's an independent publishing. It's for me. It's the truth. It's nothing but the truth. That's why the government doesn't want it. By reading it, by telling other people about it, you are challenging it. And as Alex, you have been telling people, we can't sit and wait. It's good to like Gandhi. I like Gandhi. We can do yoga. We can do deep reading. But it, this is, this, these are the drastic times. And we need to really, really get up and take action. And don't say it was it's futile. You know, don't say there are two candidates. Don't say there are candidates that are not winnable. Don't say that because when you say it, that's when they win. I don't care if that candidate, the third party candidate or the third uh, person, the independent one gets 18%, it gets votes. Maybe this time that person will get 20%. And that may yes. be the cause for next time to get 40, do it, don't futile. It's not futile. If most people get up and do it, then it won't be futile. That's my closing You're statement. Right. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. Resistance is victory. And as Mark Twain said, in the beginning, a patriot is a scarce man, hated, scorned, and feared. But in time, when his cause succeeds, the timid join him because then it costs nothing to be a patriot. And you are somebody doing it when it costs a lot. So she is a patriot to the human race and to truth and to the incredible things these criminals are doing. People are waking up to the drug war. Even Pat Robertson says decriminalized drugs now. Uh, humanity will move against these tyrants. And as all of us who are small do small things or big things like you're doing and I'm doing or others are doing, it, 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 it comes together and creates a tsunami of unstoppable information. And that's happening now. Believe me, you say your neighbors don't know who you are because that's because you've been in mainstream media mainly you know, over the years, just little snippets. With what I've done at, at, at the level I've reached, it's not, oh, I'm bragging, I'm big. Uh, believe me, the system knows how big we are. They try to they try to ignore it. And that's fine because that's a badge of honor for us. But I go out in public anywhere in the world now, anywhere, and it's not uh, it's not one out of ten people saying hi to me like it used to be. It's one out of two or three, and 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 but they all feel alone. Uh, I mean, I, I went to the Texas beach, and, and I'm not even on that many stations in Texas. Uh, for you know, even though I live here, and it's what happens in other parts of the country too. Uh, for Mother's Day with my parents to camp out, and the car parked to our left was listeners, and the car parked to our right, and people driving by would see me with my children in the surf and pull over, and the the uh, the park rangers knew who I was, uh, and, and again, and that shows. But one group was awake, the other group were tyrants, and I think were harassing us. But the point is, is that there's a war going on, and every little thing we do is a is bullets downrange in the info war. So I tell people, just start fighting. You see tyranny, speak out against it, call it out. And, and, and when people try to ninny at you or peck at you to shut up, get in their face. I mean, this is a time to be aggressive and to be confident and to be focused. Seabell Edmonds, thank you sh uh, so much and, and thank you for, for challenging their gag order and putting your book out. Thank you, greatly appreciate it. Wow, amazing, wow. thank you. We'll have to get her back on in the near future. We're going to go to break and come back with the cartridge box. You know, there's many ways to vote. There's the ballot box. There's the cartridge box, the grand jury box. And uh, the globalists just tamper with the computer boxes. But we're going to come back and give you uh, a journey into the fun side of the Second Amendment. I like gun shows on TV. I don't, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I like watching some of them. And I, I watch stuff on YouTube, all the shooter enthusiasts. Uh, so we're going to come back with my idea uh, of that right after this quick break. And then that will conclude this marathon edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Don't forget, she's under attack. Get her book and support her. We're under attack. I don't even get into how we're under attack. But believe me, we're under <clears throat> financial attack, a lot of other attacks. And uh, it only makes us stronger, quite frankly. It only makes me get up earlier in the morning and work harder and know how real this is. I was going to mention this to Bell, but I forgot to do it. You know, when, when, when the government calls up and tells you what your wife was just telling you and threatens you, and goes, yeah, that's right. We're listening to you, punk. Or they call your wife up and say, I see your dog in the backyard. Can't wait to cut your head off. Uh, I mean, and this has happened before in front of my crew. Like when I was at Bilderberg four years ago, same place they're about to have it in Chantilly. It had just ended. We were over there, um, you know, eating dinner before we got on the airplane. And I was talking to my wife about her family member in the hospital. And um, it was a private conversation. And then... She called back three minutes later, very upset, and they were talking about her family member hoping he died and stuff, and going, yeah, we're listening to you. 
I mean, th that's who works for this government at the, at the higher levels. And I know it was all the guys that I'd just seen as their security detail. They, they were U.S. government, State Department. They think calling up and being mean to an American citizen, a journalist's wife, is cool. Listen, buddy, all you did was give me massive energon cubes. You understand that? All you did was give me fuel. All you did was recommit. All this stuff, that's not, there's a hundred other stories. All of that only lets me know how real it is. Believe me, folks, this stuff is real, okay? This is so real, I can't even explain it to you. And these are bad people. And the little minions think it's cute to call up and tell somebody's wife stuff like that. People that call up and threaten to cut her head off, stuff like that. Folks, do you want your kids growing up in a country like this? I know you don't care, you're a mercenary. But there's a lot of people in the system who aren't bad. You feel bad when you're part of this for a reason. It's not good for humanity. I see so many cases now where cops or retired cops have their sons and daughters tasered or beaten to death for no reason by police. Folks, this, all this comes back on you. All this stuff's going to come back on you. That's, look, you don't have to wait to die to be judged. You can debate all that all day. I've learned one thing. What you do comes back on you. What you do comes back on you. And you can call that God-fearing. It's like you feel the universe looking at you. You know when something's not good. You got to go with that conscience. Okay, that's, that's your inner compass. The globalists want you rudderless. Don't be rudderless. We're going to come back and uh, have some fun. I'll tell you, this is spectacular. This is spectacular. First half's powerful. Second half, spectacular. 15-day free trial, prisonplanet.tv. You put fuel in our tank, help us be strong, help the crew be strong and be financially secure so they can work hard and just work hard for liberty, work hard for ourselves, work hard for you. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. I can, I can feel the power of humanity rising. We are going to stomp the globalists right back to hell where they came from. Stay